We're here. I know. I'm sorry for like for the teachers in particular who aren't on schedule right now. I'm like, I'm sorry. But you need to make better parking in your parking lot. They need to do a parking hour for you guys. I agree. It's just carpool from Ogden, right? So I drive down from Ogden every day to work. But because of that, I wanted this traffic. So I leave my house like 6 in the morning. There's always parking at 6 in the morning. Well, I get there at 6 45. It's beautiful, but I can imagine it's pretty difficult to work as you come here. Yeah, right? 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 Yes. I apologize for that. Really. Yeah. We'll have to talk to him about that. So I just wanted you guys are all here for the middle of the program, right? So you're all in the right place. Um, this is Jessica Smith, and she is here to support me today. Like I said, there's a sign on every row. So I'll actually get those, those sign in sheets if there's one at the end of the table. <laughs> Do you guys have anybody else that you know was here today that yes. is not here yet? Yeah, my principal. Okay. We want to wait a few minutes so she can get started. Get started. Get started. Get started. Get started. Yeah. This is actually scheduled for two hours, but I also know it's summer and I also would like to not spend your full two hours. But I also am here to answer any questions and help you guys support each other through the program. So, what that looks like and however long that takes is however long we'll be here, okay? <laughs> So just to introduce myself, I wanted to let you know my name is J.D. Robinson. I actually started here in September. So I am also in this program, but I do have, and this program was actually with Ms. Williams before me, and then she got a promotion at Earl. She transferred departments and went up. So she still is in charge of the youth assessment, for anybody who wants to know that. Ms. Williams is still in charge of the assessment part, but I took over the grant part. So, I'm the one that's in charge of monitoring, I'm the one that's in charge of the universities. So, but if it's related, this is still your goal. And if it's anything else, then it's me. So, um, prior to that, I was a teacher for 19 years. So, just know that I miss those tiny humans. But <laughs> I do actually appreciate what I'm doing. Most of those 11 of those 19 years was in care. So, it is a love that I have as well. So, how many of you are here for the first time? Right. How many is it your second year? Okay. And who's in their third year? Okay, so so the first year people get to know your third year people because they can help you a lot through this program. Um, you might want to exchange some names. It's a good way for you guys to correlate, like, how do you do the reimbursements on that? Or how are you doing the instruction for literacy and diversity in your classrooms? This is a competitive grant, and it was actually set up so that we could get the keep assessment to prove that Alden Kindergarten was or is helping students. And so that is set, or this. First, let me go back to my introduction really quick. <laughs> I just had surgery a couple weeks ago on my back. So to let you know, I probably will be sitting for the rest of the remainder of this <laughs> presentation. And today is my first official day back. So, I'm trying to speak English, number one. <laughs> You're doing great. Yeah, I've been at deaf school for 11 years prior to coming here, right? So, anyway, <laughs> but I just wanted to say, please forgive me if I'm, like, moving around and I'm slow. But it's okay. So, um, but with the, when this grant was passed, the history of it, it was, in 2013, it was Senate Bill 168. Well, yeah, 168. And with that legislative session, it also allowed us to create the KEEP assessment. And the reason that KEEP assessment is there is, like I said, is to collect data to prove whether full day kindergarten is helpful for students or not. The data is coming back very strong that it is beneficial for students, especially beneficial for students. That if you're in a school for free and reduced lunch, or if there's no generational poverty, it's really helping those students gain. And so I just wanted to give you an idea on that. Representative Snow is the one who brought up the bill. Representative Snow is also the one who is already in the process of looking at how do we fund more all the kindergarten programs. And that was the question that you had asked me. We wrote down in the elevator together. Yes. So <laughs> how many years do they have to look at this process? That's a good question. Okay. This is the third and final year of the KSEP grant because it was based off of TANA funds. 
And with those TANF funds, that will go away. So this was a TANF reserve program, and it allotted so much dollars. But every year I get $2.8 million that I can share with districts to run an extended day program. Do we get to be a pitch? And we're on our third year. We want to go next year. So that is where we're hoping that Representative Snow can go to the legislation this year and up that amount so you guys can transfer to what they call the OEK program, the optional extended day kindergarten. And so that's what the hope is, is that those funds will be increased. So you will have somewhere to go next year since this is the third and final year. We're in our first year. Do we get three years? No, the funding was just three years. Okay. Do you guys have any questions so far? Okay. I'm going to sit down because then I can read my notes. So. Um, but Representative Snow is the one. So I'll just say real quick, and maybe Jamie will give you further information as it gets closer, but we just were in the situation with the preschool grant. Um, my three years ended in June, and so we had to be on the Hill last um, session advocating for funding. We'll be there again because we didn't get enough. Um, but feel free to like make sure that your like, district representatives that work with the legislature, that they know that this is valuable to you. And they can advocate for it. Make sure your principals know, um, as well as contact your um, area senators and representatives and let them know that this is coming through and that you support it and that you need it. When they hear from the community and they hear from you guys that it's valuable and it's not just another thing coming across their docket during session, they're more likely to approve it. Um, we saw that that had a lot of success with the preschool. So don't feel like you're helpless and that you just have to wait for this to pass. Once it, once it really gets going, Jamie will communicate with you and, and help you know other ways that you could advocate for it, but um, make sure that your voice is heard, as well as communicating that to your, the parents that um, are benefiting from this program, that their children are benefiting, they can contact their representatives as well. So um, you most definitely have a voice, and that helps these get passed. So, one second. So, no, no, not for me. There. <laughs> so, in order to even apply for this program, you had to meet the criteria of having students that have at least 10% of the students experience intergenerational poverty, or your school had to have at least 50% of the students who are on free reduced lunch. Um, so, this grant actually wasn't available to all, all the kindergartners or all the, the programs that are out there, it was only eligible to those two schools or those under that criteria. So once I went through all the data and I found out who the criteria and who it met, then I sent the applications out to those schools that qualified. And so it was actually kind of nice. Um, it was a successful grant application and we were able to approve many of them. There were only two that had applied that I had to deny and it was because they were already receiving the OEK funds. And so if you were part of OEK, you can't have both programs. And so that was the only reason that those two were denied. And so I took the applications and I went for board approval in March and that was approved at that point. In February, as part of the KEEP assessment and because it's competitive grant, there was also, I had to look at the KEEP eligibility from the 2017-18 school year. And then I had to actually place some schools on probation if they weren't meeting the criteria, the performance measures on the KEEP. With the KEEP, they were looking at the literacy scores and the numeracy scores, and they were comparing them to the state data. If the school performed better than the state did, then they qualified. If they were performing worse than the state does, that just like a half-day kindergarten program, then they no longer qualified for funding, just because it is very limited. And that's the way the grant ran. So, um, out of that, we had 43 schools that renewed. Ten of them were new, and we have 18 LEAs that should be represented in the room, and we expect to serve about 1,500 students. And so I think that that's a good use of funds, right? <laughs> okay. So, so this is straight out of the bill, and we will talk about each one of these individually. 
as one way you know, it's its intended purpose is to target students that are at risk for grade three core standards, use an evidence-based early intervention model, focus on academically improving age-appropriate literacy and numeracy skills, emphasize the use of live instruction, and deliver the kindergarten supplemental enrichment program through additional hours or other means. As this grant has been, you will notice it is called an extended program. It is not an all-day program. There are different models and different ways that you can use this program, so we'll talk about the delivery model. I will tell you that if programs were originally running a morning day kindergarten, they asked to extend the day in the afternoon. If they were running an afternoon program, they asked to extend to the morning hours. So many people chose to use this program as to extend it as a full day program, but it is actually because that would be OEK funds, right? So it is not a full day program, it's an extended day program here on the script. Other people have also then, but well, we'll get to the delivery model when we get there. I keep jumping ahead of myself, so I apologize. So in order to target the kindergarten students that are at risk for not meeting grade three core standards, they have actually they have a lot of evidence that if a student can't pass the key or the duels in kindergarten. They will not be where they need to be in third grade. There is a very strong correlation between the two. And so the program is intended to catch those kids and give them the instruction they need through the extended hours and through your instruction. So deep assessment is when they, you give that in the beginning of the year, the entry exam, that is your main tool for identification. You look at those students, and those students that qualify off the key should be the ones that like if you have a half day program program in your school, the students that are in your extended day program should be the ones that qualify for their KEEP assessment. You are welcome to use other assessments in conjunction with the KEEP, but your KEEP should be the main measure of those students that qualify for that program. Um, it's been the tool that was created to use to know if the grant has been successful or not. And then you also need to know that a parent or legal guardian may decline participation. So if you have a student that does qualify on the KEEP, please make sure that if the parents are leery, you give them the option of not being in the program. Some people have come up with a form that you have to sign saying that the parents need written permission for them to be able to participate in the program. Other people have just verbally given that. So however you track that, That'll be part of the monitoring process that I will have to do that says, like, how are you making sure that parents can participate voluntarily? And so just be aware that I will be asking that question. Whether you decide to do it through paper or you say, you know, like, the teacher has a conversation with the parent, the parent knows it's voluntary. Okay. That question. We've always just done it verbally, like when we, because we have two half days and a full day, so we just ask them, what's your preference? Right. But we have to have something on paper. No, I'm just paper. saying, whatever that is, when I come to monitor or when oh, I okay. ask, I need to know your principles. So I usually monitor with the principals. And there are times that I can, you know, like I may come into the classroom and ask the teacher specific questions. But just make sure that when I ask that question, you can answer it. Okay. Okay. Whether you do it on paper, whether you do it verbally, just make sure you're able to answer that specific question. That's part of my monitoring that I have to do. This TAMA funding actually is run through the Department of Workforce Services for those of you that are not aware of that. So they are actually the ones that manage all the money. So your reimbursement is supposed to be covered here. And then the funding here actually has to go through DWS as well. And so I have to report to them. So these are things that they have given me that I have to ponder, that I have to answer. So those are the reasons why I will be asking you this. So I'm sure many of you have heard that using an evidence-based early intervention model is best practice. So please make sure that you're using evidence-based programs in your classrooms, okay? Do you guys have any questions on that? So we need to work on focusing on appropriate literacy and numeracy skills. Um, OEK in some districts, and I, there's been a handful of them, and I've never written them down because, but it, some programs for OEK have just focused on literacy alone. 
And when it came time to, for, when I got the performance measures back, some of the schools were not performing well on the numeracy because they were only hitting, hitting the literacy. They were performing great in the literacy department, but that's all their, their school was focusing on for OEK. So when you had teachers that were starting to teach the kindergarten supplemental, they were following that same OEK model. Please make sure you know that this grant is specifically for literacy and numeracy skills. Okay. Um, that additional instruction time should be spent on literacy and numeracy development. And then please know that it's not a one-size-fits-all program. You, that's where you're able to provide the individual or small group instruction to get the students where they're at and try to get them where they need to be. Okay. Um, so they need to be, and then there's that part. But as part of, so the Senate Bill 166, the school readiness bill, that's the preschool bill that passed in 2019. As part of that bill, the preschools that are qualified for this program are also asked to get literacy and literacy skills. So in those programs, we're hoping that kids are coming to kindergarten with these skills. So if you, if, because they've actually done research, these are, you know, it doesn't necessarily say that they have to know, you know, like our core asks for several things, right? But these are the foundational skills that actually tie to research that say this will make a difference in the kid's life. So these literacy and these numeracy skills, I thought, you know, since we just created them for the preschool, why not share it with you as well? Okay. So these are kind of like the focus, like if your students don't have these, they will more than likely suffer, will not suffer, but struggle later on. In their academic career, right? Um, we also emphasize the use of life and live instruction. We're not telling you that you can't use software. We're not discouraging you from, from doing that, but it should not be the main mode of instruction for that extended period. I know that most teachers will use technology as they need to, but as teachers, we like to see the tiny humans and we like to work with them, right? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I don't see this. Problem, but know that it is specifically stated in the bill that there will be an emphasis in the use of live instruction. Okay. <coughs> the other thing that's been talked about is that as part of this bill, you are asked to administer the kindergarten entry and exit exam. That has been in effect for how many years, right? Mm -hmm. It's still new. They're still like they've been able to get it to the point where they know what the numbers are going to be and they've got a program. And we are now coming up with the preschool entry and exit. Which should be well, it's, it's pilot. Well, it'll be it's done. It <laughs> it's done. just being implemented in this fall. Yeah. So if you got if you're interested, it's online. The materials are posted online. Um, where the cute materials all are, you'll just hit the pre-kindergarten assessment. So it's kind of exciting times for early childhood in that we can actually start showing that you know preschool has an effect. Um, I don't know. Recently, I think it's been a month ago. We were online. And the whole test is online. Yes. Why? Because I think you can go in there, yeah. get the test, and prep the kid. I've always wondered the same thing because it's a state test. Yeah, That's it's a like, state mandated test. It shouldn't be public knowledge. Yeah. If, if you're really using it for validity, to you know. I think what I was told though is that's for transparency. So it's the standard, not the skill that they should be able to know. So if a parent were to show them that, the teacher would still be able to show them a different skill. So blending is blending, segmenting is segmenting. So if a teacher were to have access to that, you teach all yes. different exact components of phonemic awareness and phonics, not just what's on the assessment. So it was just to be transparent with my understanding. But then you'd be expecting the teacher to come up with her own items that would test the same way in the same standard. Well, the teacher should be. You know what I'm saying? Because that doesn't seem totally get so, But I think they were just trying to be transparent with what phonemic <laughs> awareness and phonics and literacy and numeracy. Standards. Right, but if it's a state mandated test, mm -hmm. then, so then, then every test that's state mandated, mandated, mandated would be online mm -hmm. and transparent. Mm -hmm. Would it not if you use that same mm -hmm. argument? Okay, so I'm just yeah. going to jump in here. So Jamie and I both were not here when the keep was presented i will say that it was quite the like quite the thing to like get it through the board and get it approved because they're young because they're little um so my guess is that it was probably posted online for because i mean we're all about parent choice and parent access um 
And with it, them testing the little ones, I'm sure that's why it was that way. Teachers should not be coming up with their new test questions. They should <laughs> keep, keep the way it is. Um, I will talk with our assessment people and get a better answer for you guys that Jamie can send out later because um, it is interesting and I've kind of thought the same thing. Um, but that's all I have for you now. But we'll double check. Okay, I'll send them to me. Right now. I forgot to mention you guys, if you need the restroom, it is north of the elevators. Also, I don't know if you've noticed, but these little green lights are microphones. So there are microphones all over this room. So sometimes we have side conversations and this is being recorded, just in case anybody needs to get it. So just know that some of the side conversations may be recorded and stuff too. And I forgot to mention that at the beginning. So I thought I'd add that in there. Big brother is watching. So does anybody have any questions? As far as administering the keep entry and exit. I have a quick question because yes. we're new to this. So when it says evidence-based, I know there's like a state list of evidence-based programs or things that you can use. Is that what we have to go off of? You can look at that program or look at what the state has, but you can also talk to the other programs that are in here to see what they are using and what's been effective for them. Okay. All right. <laughs> um and then it's just talking about the, or doing it through live instruction. So some people have used that extended program to make it a full day program like we discussed. Some have also done extended learning hours. So they'll look at the kids that qualify and those kids will only stay for an extra hour. They won't stay for a full day. And so some people have implemented this program that way and it works well for their districts. Some people have also done this program and then asked you for some school funding as well. And so we've been able to implement some summer school funding. But just know because this is the third and final year and the fiscal year ends in June, it's probably not a good year to ask for summer extra funding. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you guys have any questions so far? Okay. I do want to give you guys some time at the end if we can get the teachers together. At one point, because like or new program directors or no, new principals, like if you guys want to divide into groups, you're welcome to do so. And I'll give you time to do that at the end. So you can talk about programs that you're using that are working or you can talk about as a business administrator, it works really well. The other thing that Jessica and I are both new, right? And we've talked about, but we're, we have teaching backgrounds and then we come to this program and they say, hey, you're in charge of this grant. And we're like, OK, great. You're in charge of the reimbursements. I don't have a finance background. <laughs> the sad, that's not sad, but the funny part is my mom and my sister run a tax business. They've asked me for years to be part of the tax business. And I say, no, thank you. I don't want to do that. <laughs> and then I come here, they say, you're going to manage this money. And I say, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I appreciate when I call the business administrators, I'm like, could you please walk me through this paperwork? Thank you guys for being so patient because all districts use it. Well, I should say all districts, but there are several different systems out there and how everybody does their financing. So they're not the same. And so when I get them, I can I, I can be great at a specific school. Like say I, I get caches and I know exactly what they're doing, but then I get San Juan's and I'm like, they are not the same. And I am new to all of this. So thank you guys for being very patient with that. Um, this just emphasizes that if you are receiving the early intervention or OEK funds, you are not eligible for the KSEP grant, but you may use local funds. So say for instance, because each program is funded $40,000. Sometimes that's not enough, right? Most of the times that's not enough, but each program gets $40,000 to run this program. When you look at salaries, benefits, supplies, and then your indirect costs are not part of that 40000 So you also will get your indirect costs. So just know that local funds may also be used to help supplement teacher salaries or benefits or supplies as needed. Mm -hmm. I only have to account for what you go through with the Utah grant system, and we'll talk about that in just a second, okay? So your data reporting, as part of this program, I have to be able to report to the board how the grant money re was received, the results of the kindergarten assessments, the assistance, or with assistance for the board employees, the number of students that were served, including the number of students who are eligible for free or reduced lunch. And then I also have to report to the board the student performance outcomes that were achieved. And so this can all be done 
if the principals made sure that they're coded correctly. So with their SSID numbers, that is all part of that program. You know, I, I, well, I shouldn't say the KEEP is or anything, but based on the SSID numbers, I can get this data and then I can report to the board. So please make sure that you're coding correctly for the kind of program that you have in schools. Well, they found out the first year of this program is that a lot of them were not being coded correctly. So when they tried to run the 2017-18 data, we had to contact schools. And then last year, I apologize because I know that I didn't want to have to send out the email that said, please send me your SSID number so that I can give you a letter by as close to possible as June 30th to let you know if your students passed or did not pass for funding for this program. Okay. So like I said before, your allow allowable expenditures are salaries, benefits, supplies, and that is part of your 40,000. Your indirect costs have been negotiated with our finance department, so all of them are different, but whatever percentage was negotiated at that point, that is not part of 40,000. So I just wanted to give you that that is what you will put in the Utah grant system for reimbursement and that indirect cost, they are automatically calculated for you. Okay. The other requirements, if you are new to this program, because it is through the Department of Workforce Services, and it doesn't matter if you're the new business administrator or the new principal or the new teacher or the whole new program, I need these two forms that are signed and they are at that table back there. So if you are new to the program, please make sure that they are signed. However, keep them in a file. I don't need to collect them. If you have signed them once, you don't need to sign them again, okay? So with this program, make sure you keep them in a file because as part of that monitoring that I talked to you guys about, I have to look that you have both of these forms, okay? So I'm just trying to give you key points and little ads so that when it does come to monitoring, you're not going, we had no idea. Um, so please make sure you keep these in a file where I say, please monitor you know where they're at. With that monitoring, I need to let you know that some of that may be done, like I may contact you through email, or I may be actually able to come out to your schools, which I would prefer. I would love to come out to the programs, and I would love to see how you're doing in your classrooms. So, but as part of that monitoring, you'll need to have the sign forms from the Department of Workforce Services that I just showed you. You'll need to make sure that all your teachers are licensed. You'll need to make sure that you can prove that the funding for this grant is used to pay staff to work on this grant. Um, that we have already talked about the, op the optional participation forms for students. So like, or I actually should say for parents, but just so you know, <laughs> that's where the optional comes in. And the student information is stored in the secure location. And then every quarter, you will get, as a principal, an email from me. And so that's what I want principals to know, asking you for the number of students that were served in that quarter in the kindergarten supplemental program. And it is also a requirement from DWS that many, I know many schools go through their own human resource department. But the Department of Workforce Services is also requiring that you post your jobs in the jobs.utah.gov or the statejobs.utah.gov. <laughs> so, if they've already been hired in your meeting, oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> sorry if, they're hired. if you're going to hire. So, like, say, for instance, you have somebody that has to leave in the middle of January, so you have to hire someone else. Please make sure you use these systems as well. Okay? Because that will be part of my court of the email. Will come out. Please let me know how many students you serve. Please let me know how many jobs you posted. Okay, that's what the email looks like every time it comes out. And at that point, it's also a good idea to contact your business administrators and ask them to submit for reimbursement. So that is actually not the principal's responsibility, but it's just a good reminder. It's the end of the quarter because as a business administrator, and I know that we work in schools, right? But business administrators don't work on quarters as much as teachers do. Teachers know what the end of the quarter is. You know when your grades are due. You know. <laughs> so... Just a friendly reminder would be nice. Part of that reimbursement process, 
And I know when I got this grant, I wasn't 100% sure on this, but those reimbursements are actually required to come in on a quarterly basis. So please make sure that they're coming in on a quarterly basis along with the supporting documents. I will have a slide in a second that will talk to you about Utah grants and just some of the things like that I've had to send back and why I've had to send them back. But just make sure that you're sending in those quarterly report or quarterly reimbursements with the supporting documentation. Yes. Will you be sharing this PowerPoint with us? I can. So you've added your emails to. Okay. So, and then we've talked about the only eligible budget categories. We've already talked about how the indirect costs are automatically <clears throat> calculated for you. And then all reimbursements have to be submitted through the management system. I know that as I've been working through some of them, like people will submit the paperwork to me and I can tell that I just need one more form. So I've been able to call them and say, hey, will you just email this to me? They're really pushing to make sure all documentation goes through the Utah grant system. And so this year that will be something that will be a little different and I apologize for that because some, I will have to send it back and say, can you please give me this form? I apologize in advance. So I'm going to do everything I can to let you know <laughs> what I've noticed on those that I have to send back, okay? So um, I also wanted to let you know, John McQuarrie, I don't know if you have met him yet. Um, he was the gentleman that walked in here with the red shirt earlier, but he will come in around 1030. So if any of the business administrators have any questions about Utah grants or about how to submit reimbursements or about reimbursements in general, John will be here at 1030. So I just wanted to let you know that as well. So um, things I have learned in Utah grants, <laughs> I can only accept reimbursements or actually the state can only accept reimbursements through 630 of 20. Because your fiscal year runs 7119 to 630 of 20. However, because I'm a teacher and Jessica's been a teacher, we've said that doesn't work for a lot of programs because the, they will prorate pay that will go through, at, like say September, right? So if that is your situation and if that is happening, then please let us know because at the end of quarter four, when they do the reimbursements, if you have a teacher that salary and benefits will be paid throughout that month, I will need accrual by 610. I just wanted to let you know that in advance. Some districts have figured out how to get those posted before 630, even though they're not sending the payments out. So that's why I said some of you business administrators can get together and talk about how that might work for your program. And so the teachers can get together, but I just wanted to let you know that. In the Utah grants, please make sure that the supporting documentation ties to the numbers that you're giving me. I have had some people that have asked for a, like $20,000 for a salary, right? But then they send in supporting documentation for 13. I can't approve that paperwork until I can match those numbers. Um, the other thing to know is that the dates, I've had to send back some because say for instance, if you submit for quarter one, right? So that may run like July through September. And then the next time you submit your request in January, for instance, it still might say July through January. And because we've already submitted for this, we've already re reimbursed for this amount, I have to send that back and say, please change your dates. So these are just all simple things that I know I've had to send back for that might save you some time. Because I know as I would be frustrated if I kept getting things back, but just know that these are things that I've noticed. If you have receipts, please make sure that there is no sales tax. Or if there is sales tax, I can't reimburse you for that. So make sure that the amount that's on there, the total, does not include sales tax, okay? Um, the other thing that's very, very helpful is if you can circle the total and you can put a check mark by the fact that there's no sales tax and put a check mark by the date so I can make sure that the date's also within that reimbursement period, that would be beneficial, okay? Um, some people and some programs use just a spreadsheet. They have, made, they have asked that we make sure that you send the supporting documentation from like a ledger that your program uses because spreadsheets can be altered. So you are welcome to send a supporting spreadsheet. So you can tell me like, this is exactly how we tied it to where we're at, but that's, it can't be a spreadsheet standalone, if that makes sense, okay? 
And then um, sometimes people submit the reimbursement and forget to attach the supporting documents. So I've had to send back several saying, please add the supporting documents. Okay, so it will save time for you. You'll get re your reimbursements in a more timely manner if I can get the paperwork that I need. Okay. Um, this is also something that John recommends. If you can put tick marks or just something that says like, here's where our salaries meet, here's where our benefits meet, these are our supplies. If there's a tick mark that you can put on there to make that tie easier, I can send those reimbursements. I can look at the numbers, send it in, get it for you quicker. So that's just something for you guys to be aware of. If you are new to Utah Grants, you will want to take a picture. Because <laughs> this is this website that we have for the financial operations. I, mean, I forgot to put an A in Utah Grants on that. So I apologize. So when I give you that website, that may be Utah. But you will send us this PowerPoint. Yes, I will. I cannot take enough pictures. Yeah. <laughs> My phone will not allow me to keep taking pictures. Well, it's just much nicer to have it in a I, document I can share. I made a note, soon. so we'll... Thank you so much. <laughs> That's the other thing. Jess is here to help you with all of this fun stuff. So thanks, Jess. Um, and then if there is a problem with Utah Grants, if you're having a problem figuring it out, here is an awesome helpline and a website that you can go to to submit your questions. And then there's also a reimbursement schedule for LEAs. And that is on, or for the business administrators, and that is also on that back table. It looks like this. Okay. If, say, for instance, you're submitting paperwork in January, and the date on here is 110 to 2020. Even if you submit that to me by 111, so it's only one day late, you will not be reimbursed until February. So if you can get your paperwork to me <laughs> by the dates that are allowed on that um, monthly allotment deadline, that would be great. It'll help your program. Okay. The sooner the better, though, because documentation takes a while to like look through. So, like that's the minimum. Don't get it in by that date then it will have to go in the next month's allotment but the sooner you can get it to jamie don't wait for that day if it's ready send it over in if i have any questions i can call you too or if i have to send it back then you have time to get the paperwork that i need so that you're not waiting so i just wanted to let you know there's the re the different reimbursements um the great news i followed up on this um, the, it is set up. It's ready to go in Utah Grants. So you guys are actually able to look at it right now. It's called the 20 KSE Kindergarten Supplemental Enrichment Program. Um, it's been set up in the system. And the application is set to expire on 11 one of 19 at 5 p.m. So I just wanted to let you guys know that it is up and it is ready. And I also want to let you know, this is part of my monitoring that I have to do for the Department of Workforce Services. They talk about having an EO officer, your EO officer is your equal opportunity officer. I'm sure that every school has a problem for grief or has a process or that they follow if there's agreements that needs to be filed in the school. But I also know you have a human resource office that you can go to in your districts. And then you may also contact the Department of Workforce Services, equal opportunity officer, if you have a grievance. And then there's my contact information. So if you have any questions, please feel free to call or to email me. So are there any general questions that you guys would like to ask? Okay. So if we could kind of just separate for a second. And like I said, John will be here at 1030. So we have 15 minutes before John comes and he can just talk to the business administrators so the teachers and the principals can talk as long as they need to. But if we can have teachers kind of in this section and principals kind of in the middle and your business administrators over here, then that way you guys can talk about the programs so that if you wouldn't mind helping our new programs, that would be appreciated. 